So who wants to work in a world-class team? Please raise your hands. Great. In the coming 40 minutes, I will reveal you some secrets how to become a world-class team just following simple rules. I will uh, explain you how you should, should get rid of excuses that stops you being best in game. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Soros, I'm from Vilnius, from district Pashalaichi. The place not far away where the Chernobyl movie were taken. I used to start my career probably 20 years ago, probably I should say previous century or even previous millennium. I used to work in different companies, I used a lot of technologies and I was always interested in a company's work process. How does the company set up the development process and why it fails? I will share my experience and findings. How much of you work in agile way? Yeah, great. But please don't tell this to your customers. And I will explain you why. This house, which stands in front of this building, was built long time ago. Probably in those days there were no such word as agile, scrum, backlog, sprint. While this house was not finished, Mm -hmm. The third part of it was already occupied by the customers and gave the value to the owners, ideal one. So we all agree that this same principle should be applied in software development as well. But as you can see from example, that's the only one I found a real example that it works. Actually, I have not faced any example, good example in the real world that this works in agile software development. So it means that in probably 98 times from 100, we will fail to deliver software in, in such way. So why we should boost ourselves to our customers for things that we might not achieve. Another example is imagine that you are calling uh, the taxi to the airport and you sit down in the taxi <laughs> and the taxi driver says, well, we are working in a agile way. And you say, so what? Should they pay less? No, no, no. Should they pay more? Mm, probably. So why boosting for the things that I don't care? I want to get to the airport. The same as customer. Customer wants software functionality, etc. He is not he doesn't care how you do that. Okay? Let's move further. Um, the first thing that you need to figure out is a team. And we should all agree that there should be no I in the teams. Uh, every team member should be able to do any task that is assigned to a team. There should be no such sub teams or etc. That, that don't do. I, I met a lot of examples in my career that if there is some kind of a senior or lead developer in team who says, well, I will not do this task because it's too boring for me. Someone else should do that. That's not a world-class team. The only difference between junior and lead developer within team should be only the tempo, the pace, or, or, or the speed of development. Otherwise, uh, you will have problems or you will not be able to deliver something cool and you will not be treated as a world-class team. If we look at the World Cup Championship, which ended not a long time ago. The champions team, Spain won. Uh, every team member that was on the court uh, made at least one free throw, made at least one uh, uh, field, field, field goal, and, any, and all of them throw at least one three point shot. So, when no kind of separate players who, who played for a three pointers line, and others just uh, near to the basket. So every team member should be able to do. But what you should do if the life happens and there is I in a team? There are three probably best choices. First of all, you may ask your managers to narrow down the scope for a team. It will work. In those cases, when there are enough teams that he could chair a takeover of some task that currently is assigned to a team, 
it works only probably in a big teams, in a big company. Another option is that you may request uh, the managers for trainings. That will work definitely. But sometimes it's hard to find good arguments for the manager why we should do that. And the most efficient and the most easy one is to ask managers to reorganize the teams. In a big company, it's quite common practice to change the team quite often. And nobody treats this as a failure or a bad thing or a bad habit. Uh, from my experience, if you change a team at least uh, two times or one time per two years, it, it, it's nothing wrong. I even think, uh, I, I used to work in one company that teams were managed to the project. The project ends, the team is reallocated to other teams to another project. Uh, I know that such company still works and they're treated also uh, as world-class companies, but I can't tell because I, I work in a CB now. Uh, okay, let's move further. Uh, when we have a team, we need to estimate the task, that important procedure as well in development. And if someone asks you how long it will take to uh, prepare this software, how long it will take to code this uh, function, always include a number in your answer. Don't use such excuses like, well, your requirements are, are not clear enough, I'm not sure we need to have a discussion, we are in the middle of backlog, and etc. Don't use these excuses. You won't be treated as professionals. If you don't know uh, the answer, how long it can take, just shoot an open range. Like, it will take from one month and up. Yeah? It's, it's a good way to, how to start the dialogue clarification dialogue with a customer. Uh, the same example could be if you go to a travel agency and ask uh, salesman, how much does it cost to travel to Bahamas? And imagine if the sales person will, will start saying, well, it depends on your requirements. Uh, well, your requirements are not clear enough. Or probably if how you would feel if he would say, how much money do you have? So you won't read it as, as a professional company if they will start such questions instead of answering that it costs up to, from 2,000 and up, yeah? So you start the dialogue, what do you give up, how much, and etc. So always include a number in as any estimates that you were asked. Another thing is about the planning. When you have plannings in your team, uh, there are a lot of uh, books, articles, and blogs how the planning session should be managed. Uh, but I would like to ju just add one thing. By the way, do you know how long does it take to assemble the Boeing airplane? Does it? Yeah, probably no. So you, you cannot plan a task. So when you do a planning session in your team, uh, you should have at least one rule, and that rule should say that we should have tasks that can be finished within a half day by each member of the team. If you don't know how to split the task into smaller one, probably it will happen like this. You will stand, uh, stand up saying, well, yesterday I've been working with this task, today uh, I will continue working with this task, and I'm hoping to finish tomorrow. So, because you don't know how to split it, it means that you don't know how to finish. And vice versa, if you don't know how to finish it, you don't know how to split it. So, use more time on planning session to discuss and find a way how to split the task into small ones. And of course, you will have more benefits as well, like it will be easier to track, uh, you will be confident, uh, you, have, you will have less bottlenecks, and probably you will have less failure sprints. Follow this rule, it's mm, very, very useful in my experience. So, when we start development, we know what happens. Changes comes. And we start using excuses as well. 
Why you haven't said it before? We already have planned. We have already started development. Should we put this into another release? Should we finish with the existing requirements? And etc. etc. A lot of excuses. And imagine another case. If you're watching the live basketball uh, live broadcast, and there is an overtime, and TV channels, TV channel decides. Uh, not to show the overtime because it was not planned. You would say, oh, it's not acceptable at all. So the same is in software development. If someone asks you for a change, it means that he cares uh, you are doing something right. Otherwise, if you don't have any input or any change requests, probably, probably you are doing something wrong or probably it won't, your output won't be used at all. You are doing nothing. So say to yourself, changes are welcome, always, in any case. So when we start uh, working in a team, a lot of times team decides to try something new, new technologies, new ways of integration, and similar things. And the best way to practice it in a team use more programming. Have any one of you used this in your work already? No, okay, so here is my team that we do it from time to time. Uh, the purpose of, of this flow is that there is only one PC and a meeting room, only one. There should be no more computers. This computer should be connected to the TV set and there should be only one driver or, or writer, or how do we call it, who will write the code. Other ones will look at the TV set and have a discussion on a code, on a settings, and etc. After one or two days of working, everyone within the team will have the same clue about the new technology, and probably uh, at least after two days, or at most after two days, everyone within the team will be able to continue working on his own, and everybody will have the same knowledge of a new technology, of a new way of integration, or something else that you are trying to learn. Another thing, if you are afraid of too many changes in your project, there is uh, quite new one uh, instructions. Uh, one of the Google companies, or it was not Google company actually, they invented this design sprint, and then Google bought them because the Google liked it. Uh, it's called Design Sprint. It has one strict rule that, uh, few strict rules actually. First rule is that it should not last no longer than five days, or exactly five days. And another rule is that in the first three days you cannot develop anything. You, 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 there is a lot of exercises to figure out the requirements. The, on fourth day you are allowed to build the prototypes uh, and show it to the customers. Uh, you will face a lot of questions in those three days that you will try to get an answer. Probably you will get them and you will see how did you, did you know uh, it did before and how it changed. Uh, after this sprint, you will have the same clue, the same idea, what you are trying to build, the same vision will have the customer and you will dramatically reuse uh, the probability of uh, big changes in future. This is a good way. You, you may try to find more details about it in a Google, about Google Sprint, yeah. Okay. When you code, this is another topic, uh, about coding. When you code or do something, uh, you should take care about the quality. And you should ensure, try to ensure the maximum quality by yourself. Uh, the most easy one and the most popular one is to use for eyes principle. It doesn't mean that you should wear glasses or look at the same thing twice. You always should ask your colleague to review it. But in my experience, what I have uh, seen that uh, why it fails because sometimes someone decides that this task is too small or too easy to be reviewed. Let it be without doing. So this rule should be applied always. 
no matter if it's a small, it's a big, or uh, an easy task. There is uh, an example from my experience that someone, we, we were working in one project and there was a, a task just to order some <coughs> network firewall port opening and we need to fill the form, request form for, for network department to open the ports. So someone made a request form, filled the form, sent it, he received, the order was executed, he received the notification, it's complete, and he said, stated, yeah, the ports are open. Another developer tried this and it didn't work. So the first idea that came to him, of course there is a bug in a source code that it doesn't work because the ports are open. So he invited other colleagues trying to find the bug and we wasted, entire team wasted more than one day to figure out that the problem was in a request for ports open. There was uh, one letter mistyped in a server name. And uh, what could happen in, if we could use this four eyes principle? The guy who, the colleague who filled the form, it was not me, probably, <laughs> uh, would ask his colleague, take a look to the filled form before submitting. So he or she, with his fresh mind, fresh view, fresh everything, will just look at, hey, you missed the letter. Probably he will lose or waste seven seconds, but it could save uh, more than one day to an entire team. So this rule should be applied in any case. And the best way to do is to apply this rule on your day, not only at work, and the entire your day. Okay? The next topic that I would like to touch is about uh, security. There are a few slides about it. <coughs> So if I ask you, uh, some of you, uh, especially those who work uh, in a company that are making software for uh, internal use, probably most of us thinking that nobody will hack us. So why they should hack us, it's internal use. And how do you think, if you will be asked to do something for external, how will you gain those uh, competence, those practice, and those experience to, to building secure stuff if you do not practice it while building it for an uh, internal usage application. So there are a lot of cases you, you may check that uh, former employees uh, are making damage after they leave if, if they are hackers or they have bad intentions. World-class companies such as Apple, for example, is offering uh, $1 million for those who can hack the iPhone. No matter if you are a former employee or you're just a kind of standalone hacker, if you will find a way how to hack it, they will offer $1 million. The Google has a lot of applications and they're offering the hackers for the prizes uh, for different stuff, but in total they are offering more than $3 million for those who would like to hack. Does your company offering something as a price for a hacker? Probably no. So it means if someone will find a way how to hack it, he will start thinking how I can earn from it. If I can't, uh, then I will decide, should I do a harm or not do? But uh, you should be aware of everything. Don't trust uh, and don't believe in this fiction that nobody will hack you. There was a very good story illustrating this. There, was, there is a company, British Airways, uh, last year they ordered uh, for external company probably that they should build a landing page for our customers, for the loyal customers, like to enter email uh, and receive some uh, kind of confirmation that you would like to receive more offers and something like it's according to GDPR requirements that you kind of allowed it to receive some marketing material. And there was a bug that someone found a way how to retrieve the list of emails. No names, no settings, no bank accounts, no pin codes, just the list of emails. It seems kind of uh, not serious, yeah? But for this thing, company was fined for 100 more than 180 million of pounds. 
for, for exposing list of emails. Because someone took those emails and wrote another email to the same, saying, pretending that I'm a British Airways company, please enter your credit card and buy a very good cheap flight to, to some interesting countries. So they collected uh, card numbers and used them and for this reason uh, British Airways were fined one and a half percent of their year turnover. So simple thing but cost a lot for a company. If we could share this money to all of us, everybody probably would be happy. Uh, how to avoid security defects? There is a chart statistics that in probably 85% of security defects are created while coding. Uh, then some, the next part is done while system test, while there is a test running and someone requests to, to do small changes and during those small changes in acceptance uh, some more uh, defects, security defects are introduced. To fix them, of course, the cheapest stage is to do while coding. Otherwise, uh, the cost for, for fixing will cost uh, more than 600 times in average if this fix uh, will be found, or this issue will be found in production and will need to make an extra uh, bug fix and release it. Thus, Anybody of you know how to write code without security defects? How to avoid security defects in your code? Probably, if I would ask a complete person, he would say, well, I think that I know. But if I ask, uh, do you know how to play saxophone? Probably the answer would be no. But if we look from the same perspective, you haven't tried both things. You haven't tried uh, play a saxophone, and you haven't tried to write a code without security defects. But in one case, you think that you probably know. In another case, you think that you don't know. These things you cannot learn yourself. You should always uh, update this information, attend free trainings, attend paid trainings, and you, you should at least visit some external training at least one per, per year or at least two times per year if it's a uh, trainings on a Google or, or on YouTube and etc. You should always update this uh, info. For example, very interesting case that you won't find in any coding book. When you have a login session, does anybody of you already know that <coughs> when user logins, you should start over the session. You should change the session ID, the cookie for the session. Otherwise, it's a security issue and someone will, can find the availability and then think about how we can this used for, for bad things. So those things you, you, you cannot find in any coding book. You can just find them out things from people who uh, faced this problem and were hacked they will share experience. That's the best way to update this info. Another thing about testing. Everyone should be responsible for testing on his own. Do you know this guy? Yeah, it's a Gordon Ramsay, well-class chief. When he works in a kitchen, he always tests everything by himself. No matter how much uh, support he has, how much uh, colleagues he has, he always tests everything himself. Why? Because he cares about his reputation. He is treated as a world-class chief. The same should be applied uh, in your development process. No matter if you have dedicated tester teams, no matter if you have acceptance environment that customers should, should do checks, uh, tests on their own, everything that comes outside your team should be tested. And if someone uh, will find a bug, nobody will remember all success cases 
from previous years, from previous, everything will be forgotten, and your bug will be remembered uh, at least for one month. And if the bug will be found in a production, probably this bug will be remembered for years. Everybody will remember that you made a bug. You made a bug. And there is a, a good example. Uh, we actually probably, actually probably know the case about the Boeing when there was a crash, that there was a bug with a Boeing Max 8, that there was some bug regarding the keeping airplane uh, nose at the same level. Uh, when they figured out it after the crash, they were trying to find the person who developed the software. Nobody was trying to find who made tests, who made the verification, who approved it, but everybody was playing, play, blaming the guy who, who made a bug. He found them, uh, and there is uh, a joke, not a joke, it's actually uh, kind of unofficial information that uh, this guy and $15 per hour who developed the software. So nobody is looking for a testers, uh, nobody is blaming testers, everybody is blaming the, the source. So in this case, you should do the test on your own. No matter if you have testers or not, if you have acceptance environment or not, you should be responsible on your own. And what you should do when you find the bug? You should fix it at once. From my experience, uh, there were some teams who, who went in this way. If we find a bug, we put it into a separate backlog, and when that backlog for bugs is quite big enough, let's put it to the spring and let's fix the bug. Yeah, sounds very great. But what happens when it comes to real life? When we start working with those bugs, then we find out, well, it's too late to collect the logs, because too long time passed, uh, we cannot reproduce it anymore. Probably, we decide that probably the, this bug won't be reproduced because we already have made some changes and etc. So those later bugs become never. So do you know Toyota case, Toyota company, the car manufacturer? For those who don't know, every man who stands in a production line he has power to stop the production if he finds the bug or space for improvement. So you should have the same rule in your team as well. If someone finds a bug, you should stop going outside. Don't push it to go to testers, don't push it to customers, to accept and demand, and etc. This is quite a good rule, but very hard to achieve. What, do you know this chapter? Probably yes, and this is your According to him, it would sound like this. So fix you must, the book you find. You may ask, what I should do if I cannot fix it myself? In this case, you should be responsible for fixing it like from a managed perspective. You should poke your colleague, you should poke another department, I don't know, five times per day. Have you fixed? No. And now, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you need to find a strategy, but you should be responsible to fixing this as well. Imagine real life example. If you coming home and you see that uh, you, you have a broken window at your house. So what you do, you probably call the window service company. It's not Microsoft, but it's a window service, normal windows <laughs> company. And you ask, can you fix the window? And imagine if the company says, well, we're working in Agile, uh, we need to prioritize your request, we're in the middle of the sprint, and etc. Will it be acceptable to you? No, thank you very much. Not thank you, but you just yank the phone and try to find uh, another company. The same is with the bugs. If someone comes to you and says, well, I found a bug, uh, don't push away this information. Try to fix it at once. There should be no the worst thing is that uh, that I met is technical debt uh, allowed. Technical debt is a very, very uh, good excuse for non-fixing bugs because you won't fix it at all. You just call them technical debt. So if you won't fix uh, the broken window, what will happen, let's say, in one week? Entire house 
probably will have uh, all broken windows. The same is with the software. How to detect that? If you don't fix uh, errors at once, the, the, you just delete them and cannot be reproduced. Uh, probably after one year or half year, some members start talking like, well, it's time to start over the entire project from scratch without bugs. There are too many bugs. It's too boring to fix them. To fix them, uh, we cannot create something new. We should always use a legacy. We, we, we cannot create something new. And if it, nothing changes, the, the colleagues start updating their LinkedIn profiles. And in near future, there is a new team working for the same problems. So, if you want to avoid that, follow the rule that you should fix errors at once. Automation. Yeah, we all agree that we should automate everything that we can. Yeah, release, especially releases. But we should also automate testing. We should automate verification, kind of monitoring, and uh, other things that allows to detect some bugs in future. So we should automate these things. In this case, uh, there is nothing to add unless you should always. Not always trust yourself as well. You should ask uh, managers, maybe for a consultant, or you should ask another department to help you set up the, the, the automation pipelines for everything that is possible, not as much as you can. Don't be so confident on your skills. From my experience, my thoughts, probably not experience, but from my thoughts, the Prepared automated pipeline works approximately for five years. How do I know that? The average lifetime or of application is three years. So after three years, probably there would be a, start a new application. While this application is building, the previous one will be supported. So the same pipeline will be working as well. And probably when the new application will be ready, Probably there will be new technologies, new ways how to update the pipeline. But in any way, it will stay probably for five years. So you will probably need to invest uh, one month or not month, one week asking colleague the, the budget for that. Also, it's not very big. You may try to request the managers. But this will work for five years. It will save a lot of mood for, for your team. It will save a lot of energy. And you will have more free time to do something interesting that you would like to, instead of doing manual releases or manual log collecting and things like that. Okay, so if we come to automated deployment, we should agree that the best way to do deployment in a world class, we should deploy it at least one per day into production. Such company as Amazon does release to production more than 100 times per day. You, you don't see. It. There are a lot of ways how to manage it from technical perspective. Uh, there was already a speech about uh, OpenShift, there were speeches about uh, Docker Windows containers, how to make uh, zero down time releases. Of course, you will need to use some verification test as well automated, you will need to automate uh, a lot of things and you will also need to, to use feature toggling when the feature you are releasing is not available for all users or some special users. But all, all things should be deployed at least one, once per year, well, once per day, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see how it works. Sometimes in a big conference, like right? they, they, they start release in advance in six months, and they, we will have a release in February, so they're starting to prepare it uh, at summer. And nobody sees the value of it, but it's kind of a normal procedure for them. I don't like that. So, if you do deployments at least one per day, you probably will be sure that there are no changes in infrastructure or all the changes. Unexpected changes in infrastructure will be detected as soon as possible. 
when it comes to real life and you need to do an extra quick release for doing extra important things, you will be sure that you can done without any warnings. Otherwise, I would have, when it comes to release after a year, well, we figure out that some environment changes, some network changes, it doesn't work anymore. Those procedures that were written 10 years ago doesn't work anymore. You should not have no hard knowledge. Someone should tell what you should not follow from the, those instructions, and etc. etc. This thing also is a kind of a good indicator if you are a well class team. Another thing that I would like to touch is about involving the stakeholders in your work process. The biggest uh, mistake that I've seen in that case is that the teams invites product owners, the teams invites customers to their daily standards, demo sessions, and just send them invitation. They come to it, uh, and they just listen what they're talking about. Probably if they don't understand, uh, they are not involved. You should not invite them just kind of a guest star to come to my meeting and see how we are talking to each other. Always involve. Try to find a way how to involve stakeholders. And the most easy way to do this, if you don't think another way, you can send them request for a proof for something. You should not follow the proofs or rejects, but send them regularly. Do a proof that we will do this. Do a proof that you can do this using Outlook email, just sending with the two buttons. If you don't have Outlook, if you're using Linux on the center, you just can just send. Uh, once we did, there was a story. We did uh, uh, a kind of a first release, and we wanted also to, to, to pretend that we are professionals. So we made a static HTML file with, with, with two buttons, yes, no, agree, or reject, and we just put it somewhere on a hosting and sent the link to, to the product owner, which was the customer, and asked him kind of approve or reject. So there was no kind of interaction if, the, if he pressed this or this button. So it, it just kind of played the HTML file. So imagine what happened. He received the link, and what do you think he did? He did. He just replied, "I approved." <laughs> so we all say, "Yeah, we see it," but actually we didn't see it. So, <laughs> and the customer felt very happy because he thought that he is involved and he has the power to go to release. And he thinks he will think in this way that you are professional. Another. Topics that I would like to touch is uh, company culture. Uh, we have 10 minutes, I think it's enough. Probably we should not use Medicom and etc. There is a case. Let's read it and I will have, I'll show you the questions and we decide how we we'll vote for that, how we should do it in this case. So shortly, who can see there is a case when there are changes in company, but not all of the uh, employees buy the changes and keep working in an old way. So what you should do in that case? There are probably five answers that I've added. Let's read them out.
So, should we vote how we should think the right answer, or should we vote how it's now in your company? How do you prefer? In the Com company. Company. <laughs> okay, so let's vote uh, for a way for the current state in your company. Who is working according to answer A? Okay. Who is working according to answer B? As well. C. Q. D. And E. Yeah. Okay. So there were no actually what would answer. C and D are the right answers. The worst one is B. A and E is kind of Neutral. So if you're working in a way that is described in a B, probably you are on the bad track. What I see is the difference, when I used to work in a different companies, if you work in a non-local company, the C is commonly used. If you work in a local company, D is the common case in this for this case. Another case, the last one, uh, I probably think it's more common because I faced this case a lot of times in a lot of companies by myself and seen how it works with other companies. So for those who, who, who can't read, the case in short is that you go to a party, company party, and the manager asks you to pay. So what do you do? So here are the answers. So who will do a um, uh, case on the answer A in current company that you work? No one. Wait. B. Okay. C. Yeah, that's the most funny one. D. No. And E. <laughs> only, only two. Yeah, great. There are only two good answers. There no no so if you are think that A, D and C is acceptable, probably your company is on a wrong track as well. The same finding that I found or ensure if you work in a local company. Probably B is the most common case. If you work in a uh, non-local company, international company, E is the common case. So keep in mind that. The last thing, the last slide that you should remember. If you forget everything that I was talking, I would like to have to remind to, remind, to remember one thing. You should not ask permission to do something right. Have you heard uh, any stories that the employees were kicked from the big companies for, for doing something right without permission? Probably you haven't. So if you are forced to ask permission to do something right, probably you need to change your company. That's nothing wrong as well. Keep in mind that. And this is it. Any questions? Yeah, everybody's hungry.